starting. Okay. Hey, we're there alive. we go. We're alive. Okay. Three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 109 of the Security Podcast on the In30 Network. We are going to be talking about my Heim Times network setup. And this is an awesome show because I have a lot of cool things. And I have to thank Tom for, for listening to me complain about just about everything and argue with him over just about everything. I mean, we're talking which patch cables to use, which keystones. Do I need a keystone? What is a keystone? Uh, do I use uh, the Ethernet diagram A or B, which caused a lot of problems, I will say. And <laughs> bad Ethernet cables and Wi-Fi access points. And how come I can't do this for cheaper? And why not do this? And what about an Airport Express? And just all this stuff. But I think we got it down. And I think this is going to be a two-parter because we want to. I want to talk about this week about setting it up. And I'm still running into a bunch of problems that's going to take another few weeks. But I think I'm 90% there. So, Tom, what did you get me into? Well, to answer your first question, a keystone is slightly carbonated water with yellow food coloring in it. And it's usually sold in aluminum cans. Um, and th the company that sells it claims that it's beer, but it is clearly not. It is just water. Well, is it? Well, is that Keystone light? Yes. Okay, so it's light <laughs> yellow water. Exactly. Yes. That that takes that does take me back a very long time. The 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 light implies a complete lack of flavor, texture, and really anything that would make it a beverage other than water. So, well, let's get to the topic. So. So I recently moved. I mean, you can see my look. The the I finally got the picture in the back. I got the evil eye baby who comes and runs around every once in a while, and and I need and that's usually an opportunity to upgrade some of your gear. Would like a, my wife probably my wife wanted new furniture for certain things. So you, you you sell that you sell the old house. You get the new house. You upgrade your gear. So I said. I had a Belkin N router, I don't know, for six, seven years now. I mean, before my old house. So at that point, I said, you know what? I should change up. I was doing the wiring. We're going to do more wiring here, but we needed to do something else. So Tom said, why don't you just build a PF Sense router? I mean, it sounds like everything you're going to do. And, and I mean, so we did, or so I did. And I guess the cool thing part, and Tom's going to explain this, is it can do literally anything you ask it to. The problem is, is I, I don't know what I need it to do. Yeah, PFSense is one of those things that, you know, it, it literally does anything and everything you can tell it to do. Uh, unfortunately, that includes, uh, you know, a bunch of setup and complicated stuff and networking terms. And it's a lot harder than just going to Best Buy, buying a wireless router and plugging it in. I mean, you know, when, when you have a PF Sense router, usually um, you need an external wireless access point, And then the central box just does your routing and firewall stuff. And uh, then you've got to worry about VLANs and then configuring open VPN and then your routing, your firewall rules. And it's a whole lot of stuff that you don't worry about when you just buy the consumer hardware. But it lets you do literally everything you want, anything you could possibly desire. If you wanted to create 4,000 different wireless networks, you can with PFSense. And we're learning that. And I think we still have to work on that. But Look, there was a number of times between November and now that I kept on saying, Tom, the deal of the day is this Asus spider looking thing with 8,000 antennas. Or what about the Google on hub, which we found out wasn't really that good? Or, or why don't they just stay what I have? Or the Steve Gibson model of three cheap wireless routers. Like, why do I really need AC if I'm going to be wired in? Uh, then we went through, well, can we put DDWRT or the tomato firmware or can we put PFSense on this? And it just turns out that Woot had a deal. So if you don't know what Woot is, it's just one of those daily deal sites for a $150 shuttle box. So if you don't remember, that's these little like rectangular computers that were a big hit back in the, the early 2000s for $150. It was everything we needed. It was some, it was an i3 four gigs of ram two dual 160 gig hard drive so i got a free hard drive out of it cd rom drive the only thing i had to upgrade was i had to buy another uh, network interface card because pf sense requires two so 200 dollars. i have a uh, windows 10 now installation that i can use somewhere else which 
or Windows 7, which is pretty good. An yeah, extra, that works. Another 160 gig hard drive. But so now I have the router. By the way, downloading PFSense, following directions, awesome. Really simple. I downloaded it. It's the hard part is without the CD-ROMs nowadays, my iMac doesn't have a CD-ROM drive. To burn the ISO was a little bit challenging. And I really wish, and you guys, everyone needs to work on this. Booting from USB sticks needs to be a thing more so than it is now. I can't. Well, that's, that's how I installed mine. I, I would have given you that tip. You can totally do that. Depending well, on the, the computer you're plugging it into, but that's how it worked on mine. Well, the issue was we did this with FreeNAS, and I do this when, when I was put. I remember doing this when I was trying to install the beta of Windows 7 way back when. Windows doesn't do well, or the BIOS doesn't generally do well with booting from USBs. Like they're, they're working around it, or this just may be some weird thing that I have, but you have to set it up the right way. Like you can't just throw the ISO on and have the BIOS read it. So you have to do this and that and the other thing. And I just, I had a whole bunch of CDs lying around. I burned it. I stuck it in. It said, hey, do you want to run? I said, yes. And excellent choice with the Intel cards because we had to do that last time on my free NAS box. The the network interface card didn't work. And I had to buy it. it. Took me forever. I had to buy a new one. And as soon as I did that, everything worked. So so, so we, get it, we get it started up. Now... I, choose your username, choose your password, and then no internet works. I love that. I get it up and running, and the first thing that happens is I lock myself out. Yep, and you'll do that a couple times with any kind of enterprise-grade firewall. So it's, uh, it's always fun. What happened was you get, two, you get two ports. You have to find – you have to assign the LAN port and the WAN port, WAN being from – from the uh, from your ISP and the LAN going somewhere else, presumably to a wireless access point or to a computer or whatever it is. So my WAN, now I have a little set, different situation. I have a Fios box. So Fios requires you to use their router. You must use their router. Turns out, because I have such a high speed, they said we can't put it through Mocha or the cable network uh, the coaxial cable, you have to do it through Ethernet, which is awesome. That's exactly what I wanted. The modem just has to be somewhere on the network. They don't care where. It just has to be on and some weird node off of there. So I said, okay. So I so I put it in, and miraculously, I have internet. So I'm happy about that. So internet, uh, what is it? I have internet, but I don't have wireless yet. So... I want to stop. I want to ask Tom. So we have all these different things. Now you have to start setting everything up and that right. became difficult. <laughs> yeah. So, so the general build out with PF sense is, you know, you, you set up your, your very basic base system, which is, you know, you've got a computer with two or more network ports on it. Um, you set up one to be WAN, which is your incoming internet, and one to be LAN, which is going out to your network, because it's going to be the box that would be essentially where your typical wireless router is. So that's going to be the first hop of your network right after your modem or your ONT. Um, what, what happens then is you usually take the LAN side and you plug it into a dump switch, a big 24-port uh, you know, big gigabit switch. They're actually pretty cheap nowadays, you know, 100 and 150 bucks, depending on what you buy. Um, and you plug in devices from there. But wireless, everyone wants wireless, everyone loves wireless. Uh, the easy thing to do, and you can do this, is take your old Wi Fi access point, uh, set it to access point mode, and then just hook it up to the wire and it'll do the rest. You can still configure the wireless on there, give it a password, uh, but you don't really gain a bunch of benefits by using your old crappy router. Um, what you really want is you want something enterprise grade, and enterprise grade sounds scary, it sounds expensive, and it sounds complicated. Well, it is kind of scary, it can be very expensive, and complicated, yeah, definitely, compared to your, your standard home Wi-Fi appliance. Um, but I, I recommended uh, the Ubiquity AC Light, and it's it's really it's a great package. It's what a hundred bucks. Well, I spent the ten dollars more and got the. There's a middle range there. It was like it was okay. ninety dollars and one hundred nine that with some ten dollar off coupon or some guy doing it for a hundred. I got that. I I'm sure everything was the same, but a hundred dollars. It has power over Ethernet, and you're, 
were correct last time. It has a PoE injector. So it's one wire, your Ethernet. So yes, you have to plug it into power, but you can plug it into the power at the power spot and then run an Ethernet cable to wherever you want it to go. Right. It makes things a lot easier because you just hook up one wire and the thing is powered. It's got network. It's all in one. So so that was my that was my wireless choice. And we had this argument also, why necessarily go enterprise? And all of a sudden, I keep on seeing these articles. Your life changes when you start looking at uh, enterprise type hardware, the the Soho boxes, the small office, home office boxes for $50, $100, even $300. They're just not that good. They're just, they're, they're, they're these expensive things that do what a really old computer does with PF sense. You find an old computer, which my problem was I didn't have any old computers. I had to go out and buy one. But anything, I mean, anything you could throw a gigabit port on with I th- one gig of RAM, even uh, an Atom processor, maybe a little more than that, is good enough. It's- yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, the PF hard, the PF sense hardware that you can buy, that's recommended that you buy. Um, you know, it comes in anything from. Atom processor level to AMD APU level. Uh, and I can say I've used both. Both work fine. Uh, you know, if you're running this a giant company like, you know, a giant enterprise and the building's got a thousand people in it and you're pushing, you know, a hundred gigabits through it every day, an Atom processor is probably not for you. Uh, you can buy big iron PF Sense appliances uh, that really do a lot of work. But, you know, if you get to the, you know, gigabit, networking type of scenario there there's a point where you just you buy cisco or you buy juniper or you buy one of the the big manufacturers because they've got networking in silicon and that's fast enough to handle it but if you're you know a small business even even a you know medium-sized enterprise pf sense is going to be perfect for you uh, if you're at home you know they've got these tiny computers or you can build your own computer or use an old computer that you have laying around um, and it'll work perfectly fine for anything you throw at it. Uh, I'm a heavy, heavy networking user, and I've yet to make PF Sense fall over. My my initial stumbling block was reading the requirements, and there was a thing on throughput. How much throughput do you want? And I'm thinking, well, I have gigabit, so I definitely want gigabit. But apparently I was using the wrong metric. I didn't actually understand what throughput meant. But anyway, I got the highest, and so I'm I'm good. Whatever that is. Look, I have an i3, an i3 processor for running a simple router box is probably is probably overkill. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, any any of these small boxes you buy at Best Buy or, or anywhere else, you know, they've got the cheapest like MIPS processor or or ARM processor that money can buy. Just something that'll make the thing boot. Well, they were moving. I mean, we kept on seeing Linksys. Linksys brought back their blue box last year at CES with with six antennas and this and that. And it was it was DDWRT ready from the beginning. They didn't even put their software on it. They put straight that. They said, oh, it's powerful. It has this. It has that. And I think now we're starting to see people questioning their router. I mean... But either way, it's it's they want more power. We have more devices. The problem with more devices, and this is the segue into it, is that you have to keep everyone secure. And that was now a big problem. The ho- the, my house that I bought came with three Nest thermostats, which is not necessarily a problem. I mean, Nest has been pretty good about uh, keeping the security bugs to, to a minimum. But the problem is if there is one, what could that compromise? So that was another thing that I had to worry about. What do I do with these internet of thing things? And we keep on saying, oh, throw them off to their other network. So next week, Tom and I are going to talk. We're going to pick every internet of thing thing that we can think of and figure out where it should go and and really go and go from there. Is is in the garbage not an option? Because we can just end that episode right there. Well, the question is, what about my Roku box? Because you know what? I do stream from Plex. And you know what? It's really cool to have Plex. Uh, the Roku box hooked up so I can use Plex. Well, I love the Roku. I absolutely love the Roku. But internet-connected light bulbs, they can go in the trash. Internet-connected light switches, definitely in the trash. Internet-connected webcams, yeah, you should probably throw those away too. So, well, I got as a gift three, three, (laughs) now I have four, five wireless light bulbs. And they have a really, really, really huge fatal flaw. 
the light switch has to always be mechanically on. And I, we've talked about this. It's it's so now I'm using my Amazon uh, Amazon Echo to do all this. And I'm saying turn it on, and it turns out to like 10% brightness. And I'm like, that was so incredibly unuseful. Now I have to reach over for my phone, and I feel like I'm a slave to my phone or technology because I can't get up and turn on a damn light switch. <laughs> and you know what? If, you're, if your Wi-Fi or network ever goes out, your lights are completely off. You're well, in I, the dark, literally in the dark. I think they have some sort of fallback with internal because if you don't have the bridge, you don't have – I don't know. I, it's – it's. so anyway, so now we have to get the Wi-Fi on. And so I bought, like you said, the Ubiquiti uh, ACLR, I think it is, for $100, $110, between $95 and $110, shipped to my house. I install it, and wow – I will say it's actually very pretty. You did have to install something, which I was not a fan of. You have to install their software to log into this backend website. But it you can put a map there. It tells you all your devices. It really goes in depth on just about anything you can do with wireless. You can set up VLANs through. Well, you can use VLANs through it. You can use... Uh, the other thing, you can limit bandwidth. You can create four different wireless networks. It really had options, way more than any consumer router would have. Yeah. You know, Ubiquiti is one of those um, controller Wi-Fi access points. Uh, the reason I generally like Ubiquiti is because it's it's going to be a lot easier than the Cisco stuff to set up for non-Cisco networking people. Um, and the hardware itself is generally pretty good. It's pretty reliable. And um, it it looks good. I mean, it just does. Uh, I've got I've got one of the old ravioli style Cisco access points, and you know, used uh, off of Amazon and buying from some guy. Wireless N was like three hundred bucks. Um, it's it's fantastic. It's the best access point I've ever owned. But uh, when I go to upgrade to AC, I'm not going to buy another one of those. That would be incredibly expensive if you've never bought cisco technology not like you know the cisco links of stuff that you would find in your big box store like actual enter- enterprise grand hardware from cisco none of it is cheap it is always incredibly expensive i mean it will this ubiquity box it runs its own proprietary operating i mean it's a unix based operating system which I, I do want to say, take a segue here and say, I think now I have more Linux running operating systems than Windows operating systems, which is yeah. always a good thing. But it, it, it puts a map, it puts coverages. It Like I said, it really goes through. So we put that on. The last part of this whole process now is to is to deal with the port forwarding and finding a way to get some sort of cabling upstairs to the third floor to my office to to plug in directly. So we got the wireless down. We got the the the, the idea of the router down. We're all connected to the port switch, and now I just want to make sure I have my my wired runs in to make sure all all the stuff that needs to be on wired wired. After that, then we have to go and open some ports. Well, even before then, we have to make sure that everything is on a nice VLAN. Because uh, right now, you've just got a straight WAN and LAN setup. You've got some VLANs, but right now, your wired network and your wireless network aren't on the same subnet. Which is, it's okay. You can do that. And a lot of people do. Uh, a lot of businesses, especially, keep their wired and wireless stuff um you know, separate, if not even further segment by department or area of the building or have different Wi-Fi networks for different problem domains. But um, if you're trying to use a wired connection and shoot something over to the Chromecast on wireless, it should really be in the same subnet because uh, the Chromecast will complain otherwise. Well, let's talk about that because I, I don't know if we talked about it. So I asked Tom, how would you segment – what would you do with the wireless? So we've decided, you know what? We're going to have the the wireless network that we all trust. This is the one that you, you, your kids, your tablet, the things that you connect on. What is it? Wi-Fi is where the home is type thing. That's all fine. Then we wanted something, you know what, for the guests. Because you want your neighbor to come by. You want to always offer free Wi-Fi. I always love making sure people are completely comfortable. All my friends have Wi-Fi. I don't want them using their data. But I don't want the unwashed masses, as we call them, on my wireless network. Exactly. I, don't, I, I don't want them being able to get anywhere near my file server, anything there, unless 
unless I'm fully aware that they don't have a compromise that they're that they're clean in that case. And then I want to protect my guests. So I said, you know what? I have the ability. Let's make a third one for the Internet of Things devices. So when Phillips has a, a remote code execution that can that that can, I don't know, turn on and off your lights, it doesn't connect to the nest and then raise and lower my heat and and do all these other things. I don't want it touching any of my stuff. Let it let it do its thing on that that network. You want to join that network? That's on your own risk at this point. So. Right. And if you wanted to, you can even further segment it. You can throw everything on the Internet of Things network. And uh, if if you wanted, this would be a little complicated, but you could do it. You can even isolate each device and say the devices can't talk to each other. They get an IP address and they can go to the Internet. But when it comes to a device talking to another device on the Internet of Things subnet, they can't do it. They can't talk to each other. And PF Sense and your Ubiquity can totally isolate clients like that. It's really cool. So where, where we left it off now is – oh, and then the other thing I needed was I wanted to have a VPN, not – both in both, both cases. I built – I mean, we talked about this, my Raspberry Pi VPN, which has slightly newer directions. So if you want the updated directions, uh, find me. I'll, I'll get them to you. And – so and so any client I want can connect from the Raspberry Pi, from let's say my phone to the Raspberry Pi VPN at my house. But then I also wanted, which I don't know if the new consumer routers will do, I want a whole house VPN. I want all my traffic to be in, uh, to be tunneled over to Switzerland or the non was the five eyes countries if I needed to. And the PF Sense actually does both of that. You can take out the Raspberry Pi, but it's a really neat project to do on a weekend with your with your kids if you want to learn something. Right. And if you wanted to, you can even say, hey, these hosts over here go through this VPN and these hosts over here go through this VPN. And anything that I haven't segmented goes on this VPN. So you can have a bunch of VPN connections and send stuff out different pipes to different countries just because you can. I know my Roku, because Netflix doesn't like to play nice with a VPN, and Hulu absolutely hates VPN. So I said, hey, anything coming from the Roku just goes straight shot through Time Warner. But all web browsing traffic goes to Sweden. All anything going directly to Netflix from a computer goes to the U.S. VPN. What what I want to know is, so my Mac or most computers have an Ethernet port and a Wi-Fi port. So at least on my Mac, I can say I prioritize Ethernet first. Always prioritize Ethernet first so I get the speed. If so, if there's a hiccup there, go fall back. I think I can give the Mac different IP addresses depending on which connection it's using. Can I do that with yes. the Can I do that with the VPN? Can I say the Ethernet traffic goes on my Mac, so one machine goes here and the Wi-Fi goes somewhere else? Yes, you can. Now you will have to keep the wired and wireless segment separated, or uh, do a, a host list. So say these hosts by MAC address, right? Uh, these hosts get these IP addresses and these IP addresses go out this VPN and these IP addresses go out this one. So if you wanted to segment wireless off to a different VPN, you absolutely can. And I mean, I I can always think of reasons for that, but nothing really right now practical that says, oh, well, if I'm on the wireless, I'm going to send it here. If I'm on Ethernet, I'm going to do this. I'm going to send it there. If you really want to obscure some traffic, can you set up a Tor node on PFSense? Can you make, can you have it uh, um, route through Tor? I'm pretty sure you can. Now I haven't, I've kind of abandoned that project. That was one project that I was heavily looking into at a time, but uh, it does really defeat the purpose. I think VPN fits better than Tor in that scenario because with Tor, the entire purpose is, anonymity or semi-anonymity or mixing your traffic up. Now, if you run Windows Update on Tor, it's sending a unique identifier out, right? If you're if you're pulling down uh, updates for Android for certain applications, they've got an application profile of, oh, hey, look, these applications from this IP address just checked in. Let's go to our master database or let's, let's look at the programs that are trying to update and they can build a, a nice software profile of you and definitely point your Tor address back to you. So in some ways, it would be kind of harmful because it directly links you to a Tor identity. The government doesn't really like people using Tor, right, for the most part. Most government agencies don't really like Tor. Um, And having a true link between 
using between yourself and yourself on the Tor network is not really a great thing. Uh, and it really defeats the purpose of using Tor. If all you're trying to do is get around your ISP's blocks or make sure your ISP can't send off your traffic to marketers, which by the way, they do, they all do. All ISPs look at your data and send it off to someone so they can get some money back. Um, then, then a VPN fits way better there. With routing everything through Tor, defeats anonymity which is which like i said the vpn for look the vpn for me is to be at school where the guest network has been told to us many times that it is completely open it is not to be it's not not deemed secure it is there for everyone else if you want to do something more secure you need you have to use a school operated device to get onto the school operated network so i absolutely run everything through a vpn and make sure that all my traffic is i look it's just it's me connecting to my house i just don't want the school to know what i just don't want uh somebody sniffing the packets i don't want the school necessarily knowing what sites i'm going to on my personal phone i mean it is my personal phone not the schools and i just don't want to be snooped so i send it back to my house i'm not going for the anonymity i'm just going so that the school doesn't know what i'm doing yeah, and that, that would be a perfect use case. Um, you know, I, I personally use a VPN for all of my traffic, except the stuff I've segmented off and said, you go, you go out clear text. Um, because I, I don't want Time Warner snooping on my stuff. I, I realized, or I, I found out that, you know, stuff like YouTube actually works a lot faster if it's going over the VPN than if it's going straight shut out Time Warner. Um, there's, there's a lot of reasons to bypass your ISP. Um, other than, you know, the obvious stuff of, you know, I would like to do some copyright infringement today or whatever you want to do without your ISP knowing about it. Um, but, you know, privacy and not liking my data being shipped off to marketers is my main reason. And I mean, then the last thing I guess I'm trying to figure <sighs> I'm just trying to figure out everything. I had a problem with uh, dynamic D or yeah, dynamic DNS because the consumer routers would give you their six or seven hosts. The main one being DIN, uh, DYN DNS, which was free forever and ever and ever. And then all of a sudden went paid with all the other ones. And now you can't get a dynamic DNS address to your house. So so the router wouldn't work with it and you have to jump through all these hoops. PFSense has it has customs ones built in. You just run the command and it works. So that was awesome. And like finally, well, go ahead. Um, I, I personally, for dynamic DNS, I love, uh, let me make sure I've got this right. Checking. Yeah. Uh, afraid.org. Uh, free DNS.afraid.org. It's great. It's free. Um, you, you can do a whole lot with it if you pay for one of their uh, donation accounts or one of their premium accounts. Uh, but the free stuff is great. And it's been free for as long as I can remember. Um, they're who I jumped to after DYN started getting really annoying with their, hey, you should pay for this. And then they totally shut down the free DNS service. So I moved to afraid.org. Um, and then you know, if you've got your own domain, you can you know, sim link or sim link, you can create a C name off of it to point to your afraid.org domain. So if you have random characters dot random domain dot net on afraid.org, you can C name that over to something that makes sense, like my house dot me dot com or whatever domain you have. And that way you've got something that you know that you remember, but you're still using the free DNS service. I found so after that I I went on a, on a hunt for free DNS and I I found some that haven't been updated for years and years and years but the one I was using is Duck DNS which the guys like look we're all looking for free DNS so I'm just going to spin up an Amazon cloud service I would love for you to donate but I'm not asking for money but just remember it's free and they're really working hard it looks it looks pretty which means absolutely nothing but so far, it's been pretty reliable for me. So good. I'll, I'll have to check them out. I haven't had any issues with Afraid. Um, and anytime I VPN back to my complex here, it, it seems to work just fine and resolve just fine. I mean, I'm looking at this now. It looks. I mean, it's very simple. But you know what? Simple is not necessarily bad. Yeah, I, I have to say the Afraid.org interface. It takes a little bit of getting used to. It is not web 2.0 it definitely feels like you know something 
uh, slapped together last decade, which it was, it absolutely was. But, you know, for free, can't really complain. Um, also, it runs on the fantastic FreeBSD platform, which your PFSense box also runs on. I think I, I think FreeBSD may be the number, uh, so does my free NAS box. So I have a feeling that the majority of my operating system not only are Linux, but BSD boxes. Which is I, I would say you, you probably fall into the BSD camp because your Mac is also BSD based. Oh, well, that's right. Well, it's Unix yep. based, but yes, it is BSD. Well, BSD is Unix. That's the thing now. So, and I like this Afraid DNS has a 2016 copyright, which the others don't. So, yep. Well, I mean, we're running out of time, but basically, we talked about what we needed to do. We got the PFSense box running, we got the wireless running, and I, I want to spend next time of the problems that I had. So we talked about a little bit of them, but I'm still working with Tom of setting up exactly the VLANs that I need to run, why I need to do it. I need to get that big, you said, 24 ports switch off the LAN network and onto a VLAN so I can, uh, so again, I can segment the traffic because that's absolute. And I want to pass the wireless traffic from itself back onto the main network and go from there. And I understand what I'm doing may be crazy. Maybe just huge overkill. Could I have just bought or used the BIOS router? Absolutely. I mean, they have a guest network. It works. Their router is actually pretty good. It does all the port forwarding and everything you need, and it has overclocking and this and that and the other thing. But you know what? It's a good learning experience because you never know when you're going to need it next. So I'm happy to sense PFSense is going to be the last router you will ever need. So, well... No, you're right. It's the last one, and it's and it's bare bones. I'm not putting wireless off of it. I can I can buy a new wireless uh, access point if we go to whatever the next one is D or E or F or whatever they want to call it. So, anyway, we'll leave it here, and we will see everyone next week. See everyone. Bye. Stop.